Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to uh, Software Engineering. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and doing well in these difficult times. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about source code management systems. This is sort of a background -y lecture on a topic that's dear to my heart. I've been playing with source code management systems for many decades now, and have a lot of ideas and opinions. And so I wanted to depart a little bit from the fairly Spartan schedule in our course textbook and instead just talk to you about some things I know about source code management systems in general. And then in the next talk, we'll move beyond that and actually talk about the other thing, which is uh, actually use, doing modern workflows with a modern source code management system. But I think it's worth some background first to get things going. So before we can talk about source code management systems, the first thing I should say is that there's a lot of double quotes here. What we're really talking about is management of work products. So what's a work product? Well, it's a thing that's produced by people when they do work. So source code is certainly one of those things as a software engineer that I produce doing work. So is documentation, story cards, user interviews, uh, you know, if I record those or take notes, assets, you know, files, media, that kind of stuff that is supporting my software. Basically anything produced by a human during the process of building software, creating software, is a work product. And the first thing to get over is that the only work product that matters is the source code. Uh, all the work products have value. All of them need to be managed. And coming to that realization that so-called SCM, source code management systems, are a little bit, you know, should be managing probably everything as it thing that took us for a while and especially since because you know we're doing software everyone who's a developer views the source code as the most important thing it's first among equals it's the thing that you really need to be paying attention to that's a bit of a misguided attitude and as we'll see we've come around from that quite a bit I want to talk about some history in a little bit of detail now history is only useful in as much as you want to be informed by it, but I kind of feel like there's been a trajectory in software development that the so-called SCMs, and I'm going to refer to them as SCMs from here on out, even though they manage all the work products. There's a trajectory that sort of software development's followed, and SCM has been a part of that. So let's talk through what I would call the four ages of SCM. And if you go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, SCM was basically people, just like all of software engineering. And there were really very few tools, surprisingly few tools, used to maintain source code in that time period. And as a result, source code became corrupted, lost, mangled. I tried a decade or so ago for a paper I was working on to reconstruct the history of a software project, the nickel programming language that Keith Packard and I did. and Beyond a certain point, I didn't really have good records. Uh, whatever we had in SCM was lost, and I'm not really sure when we started out that we were using much SCM, so it was a real problem. So we got people doing all the activities manually. That includes manual backups, and I have that in quotes because, of course, if you're trying to remember to backup things manually with backup files and backup tarballs and copying stuff onto tape or disk here, and there and then and now, you're probably not gonna have a very good history of any kind of what you're doing. It's surprising that really up until almost 2000, maybe a little beyond 2000, that's how the Linux kernel source code was managed, but there we are. Documents, you know, non-source code artifacts were mostly paper, and even source code was often on paper. It was not uncommon to have a literally printed listing of the source code to a program. And obviously that's not a form that's super useful for a lot of purposes, but it was kind of what we had a lot of the time. There was a thing called the change control board, which was an important part of the process at that point. 
And as far as managing history, managing changes, coordinating developers, it was literally done through an organization of people, a change control board, and you would submit requests to change for changes of any kind to the change control board and they would manually decide what to do about them. That was a real common thing in large shops. And not a bad thing at all. There's worse ways than having people in the process, but of course it's error prone because people are error prone and it didn't scale because people don't scale very well. And so there was a desire to do better. Especially, remember, this is the time during which the exponential ramp up of software development was happening and each year there was so much more software being developed than last year to deal with. And sometime in the 80s, I guess, people started building tools to help with source code management. Uh, the classics were SCCS, which were used by the Berkeley folks, uh, RCS, SCCS, the source code control system, about which the old joke was, it's the source motel, programs check in, but they never check out, which was a play on an old television commercial about roach motels that you don't remember either. And also the revision control system, very creatively named, uh, that were sort of very primitive file at a time tools. You could manage a particular file and keep its revision history and even do some branching, but they were a small part of the process. RCS and SCS had limited support for collaboration, but mostly they were individual tools. And really the idea of a cross project commit wasn't even a thing too much. Meanwhile, source code at least quit being printed out somewhere in that area. We've at least we've left the paper era. CCBs were still around, and but they were maybe less prevalent because part of what the automated tools were for was to get past that. And then we finally moved very slowly and gradually into what I'd call the pre-modern era. Uh, everybody had accepted at that point that SCM tools were a thing. And the next obvious hurdle was, well, how do we use these tools to keep track of an entire project and an entire group of people working, people's work on that project? And so there became more tools. There's the elderly clear case, which was a very big, complicated industrial solution that's still in use today. There was Perforce, a system from the mid 90s that's still in use today. Uh, CVS in the open source world, the famous concurrent versioning system, which was actually originally a bunch of shell scripts built on top of RCS, believe it or not, but eventually got replaced with C code for better or worse. And then finally, Subversion, uh, SVN, which was supposed to be a re-implementation of the CVS idea that was better than CVS, and it absolutely was, but it still had some issues. Paper basically went away for most things. There were still printouts of things made, obviously, but sort of the default thing became PostScript and PDF once those were things and for documents and became sort of file formats for a lot of what was going on. You hardly ever saw a change control board anymore. And this really was the start of managing more work products than just the source code. It was very common to see other things checked in. And game developers still use Perforce because it has really good asset management. It'll manage your video and audio and levels and that kind of stuff pretty well. Uh, and finally, we get to the modern era, which is where we are today. And you know, there's gradations within all of these ages, but Really, the start was when we started doing distributed source code management, the BitKeeper system and the Mercurial system, both of which took ideas from older systems like Monotone and Git was finally a thing after uh, Linus had issues with Bitkeeper that are, that you can look up and are too complicated to talk about here. Uh, 
the all those things plus literally dozens of others over quite a long time everybody got very excited as they started to see the real benefits of source code management tools to try to make them work in a world where projects were largely collaborative and were collaborative across the internet, which now existed, which meant that you could coordinate things without sending floppy disks or mag tapes around. Uh, the tools, so collaboration was a big part of it. And the other big part of it was making sure that people could have their have local work and have it be managed by the source code management system. That's a big deal. Uh, paper is not a big part of anybody's software development process anymore. It You can still get it if you want it, but most people don't. Change control boards are basically a memory. You see them in very all, not no place but in the largest and oldest shops a lot of the time. And essentially all your work projects will be managed. Uh, it's very uncommon not to have anything produced by a human managed by one of these systems. So what kinds of features do these systems provide? Well, the feature set for source code management is sort of a whole bunch of things that we now expect our SCM tools to do. And the first and most obvious is the thing they were originally invented for, which is to keep track of the history of our software, to be able to capture the process the process of the creation of the software in such a way that you can review what happened in the past and this idea of a commit across an entire project became a thing sometime in the pre-modern era and this notion of versioning and keeping track so yeah that's one of the things is that these changes are atomic and you'd like to give names, identifiers to each of these changes that you make. And so some kind of versioning happen. And so you'll often hear these systems referred to as version control systems because this history and versioning is such a big part of their job. Well, I'm a little uncomfortable with that for the simple reason that there's also this notion that one of the things these systems enable is if I have several related projects that are sharing some of their code, you know, different versions for different platforms, uh, versions with dip, slightly different feature sets, that kind of stuff, all those versions get managed as well in these modern systems. And we can keep track of what's going on in two or three or four different sort of development lines and changes introduced in one can be incorporated in the others. That's really important too. We also call that versioning. And so, you know, the word version is thrown around so much in software development that I try to avoid it unless it's really obvious what I'm talking about. Another thing that we expect of our SCMs is parallel development. We expect to be able to do this thing called branching where we say, well, let's make some changes to the software along one branch while keeping the other branch you know, while making different changes across the other branch. So we, at some point, uh, branch and maybe one person starts working on experimental features and the other person or group starts working on maintenance changes to the mainline stuff. And that's not a branch that you want to stay forever. At some point you want to resolve this stuff. And so we also need support for various kinds of merging so that we can, once we figure out what we're doing with our weird, with our weird development branch, we can take the main branch and, uh, you know, bring the development code in and make sure that everything comes together into the future. And so that's something that we just expect of a modern SCM. And we expect, team stuff to be managed. We expect that one of the things the SCM will do is coordinate developers who are working independently and help them in such a way that if one person's working and the other person's working, that as little as possible will their work conflict, as little as possible we have collisions where you try to edit this function in this file and I try to edit this function in this file and we then have a mess. But also when it does happen, we have tools to try to help get that fixed up in a reasonable way so that you can get back to everything being coordinated. So that's what we're looking for. 
there's some other things that are nice to have. Uh, the three big ones I would list are, we found along the way that an interesting bad thing that can happen with source code management systems that they're particularly vulnerable to is to have disk corruption in the SCM repository, for example, because when we have that disk corruption, it's typically to blocks in 10-year-old changes to files nobody's going to notice for a long time and typically by the time you notice information has been irretrievably lost the other thing that we found is that it's very tempting to tamper maliciously with the source code repository if i decide to for example put some malware in your software it's not enough anymore for me to put it in your code because your code is being managed by the source code management system <clears throat> whoever is working with the current code is going to notice that change right away so it may be to my advantage to go back and make that change in history using the source code management system so that things look smooth and those changes get incorporated and so resistance against that is a thing that would be nice to have for an SCM. Performance. Uh, you want to spend your time, you know, it's like any other kind of thing. It's like testing. It's like editing, for that matter. Building. You want your cycles to be short. You want to be able to make a change, push that change all the way through. Well, now that interacting with the SCM tool is part of the change process, <coughs> you really want that to be fast enough that it won't slow down your work. And finally, there's a lot of complexity in source code management. There's a lot of hard questions to answer. And so there's a lot of unavoidable complexity and in the interfaces. There's also a lot of avoidable complexity in the interfaces that probably shouldn't be there. And we'd really like to have as little of the former as possible and none of the latter. We'd really like to have a user experience where developers who, again, want to concentrate on building something, not working with the SCM tool, uh, have a reasonable user experience. And this problem is compounded by something that's classic in software in development, which is that developer tools are mostly built by developers. And that's a great thing in that developers know their domain of software development very well. They're unlikely to make mistakes that will be detrimental to the core tasks of software development because they know where that's gonna go. But on the other hand, developers sort of notoriously aren't experts in user experience and they're willing to cope sort of notoriously with terrible user experiences. And so, we can end up in a situation where the UX is much worse than it needs to be because we don't get any outside help from people who really understand how to make better user experiences. Uh, ClearCase, the system I mentioned a while back, is a great example of a lot of these problems. It tended to be very hard to keep reliably working to the point where I don't know any ClearCase installations in the wild that don't have at least one and sometimes more full-time people who do nothing but work with ClearCase. The performance is, tends to be not great at all. And the user experience in ClearCase tends to be uh, pretty dismal. It's pretty hard to work with. And part of what those full-time people's job is is to help you figure out how to do things. and. You know, to contrast, compare and contrast that, Git has a lot of the same problems uh, ex with user experience. It's not great, but it's better than, it's at least simple and it's at least developer friendly. Uh, simple is the wrong word. It's at least atomic. You at least can kind of figure out what's going to happen when you try something. The reliability against accidents and tampering in Git is fantastic uh, because it has a whole cryptographic structure built into its fundamental being to the point where it's hard to fix stuff on purpose sometimes because that reliability gets in the way. The performance of Git is just stellar on a Linux box. It's just frightening how fast it goes. That was one of the design goals and you essentially never have to wait for it to do anything. So that's compare and contrast. The other thing we expect in the modern area is that 
there's some kind of a dashboard component to the SCM. And these days with everybody sharing stuff over the internet, that's gonna be a web dashboard. We really expect to be able to interact with the SCM for some kinds of tasks via the web. You know, first of all, as a dashboard. And second of all, as sort of a place to find all the things that you might want to integrate with the source code management system to make it better. Uh, issue tracking is a really important separate thing. And historically, issue tracking systems have been standalone chunks of software that didn't interact well with the SCM, and that's caused a lot of problems. Nobody does that anymore. All the modern SCMs sort of have integrated issue tracker support. Uh, collaboration tools such as wikis, project management tools, that kind of stuff. You know, all those things kind of need to be aware of what's going on with the source code. And so it makes sense to provide them as web tools. And obviously GitHub and its close relative GitLab are the sort of poster children for this kind of web SCM experience. And they interact with the command line yet in interesting ways, but at the end of the day, it would be much harder to do collaborative group work on using Git without a GitHub or a GitLab backing that up. So that's what we're looking at. That's the sort of high level view of what's going on with these source code management system things. And in the next talk, we'll drill down into some of the details of how that plays out with Git and GitHub as a workflow and sort of get into a few of the details and a few of the ideas about, okay, these we have these fancy tools, what are we gonna do with them? So that's what I've got for you today. Uh, thanks so much as always for listening. And again, please stay safe and well. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and I look forward to talking to you again soon.